non è opera maggiore quella che ci tocca. Appartiene anche al silenzio ogni gesto. Di una sequenza come una melodia, anche apparteniamo. Musica senza rivoluzione. Come una parola scarna. Solo la bellezza appartiene a quel gesto che sbirciamo di nascosto. E se io penso ogni rifiuto, per prova sottile, Diciamoci ancora la cosa che piace al senso, una terribile visione di chiarezza, come ben sai, non ti servirà. but I didn't think so much of them. But he wanted to know because he said, the more people copy my music, the more fans I'm going to have. I prendo in tatto come dovere. ci perderemo e tu sarai una lenta cantina di pace una terrorica con una grande lingua e dolcezza I'm Hollis Taylor I'm from Portland, Oregon originally. My name is Klaus Kürvers. I'm, I grew up in Essen. It's in the Ruhrgebiet. Okay, my name is Gunther Hampel. Gunther Hampel. I'm born in Germany, in Göttingen, 1936. My name is Axel Dörner. I'm from Cologne. I'm Dave Burrell. I'm a jazz pianist. I'm originally from Middletown, Ohio. That's between Dayton and Cincinnati. My name is Asi Glöde. I'm organizing uh, improvisation music and jazz since uh, over 35 years. My name is Frank Paul Schubert. I'm a saxophone player. I'm living in Berlin. I'm from the western part of Germany near Cologne. My name is um, Andreas Pichler. I'm a drummer. I'm originally from Austria, from Innsbruck. My name is Meinrad Knier. I come from the, a little village in South Germany. Nobody knows that, so it's not worth mentioning it. Luther, hey. it's a privilege to meet you. This is how you look. Come in. Yes. All the yes. painters, all the, uh, the writers, I mean, uh, all, all big people have been here in Berlin. When I go, when I sit here, like I can talk here because the spirits are here, right? When I'm in my little town in Göttingen, i have a hard time to find my spirit, but here I, can I used to play on the street because we didn't have no money. And one day we played, there came all these kids, 15, 16, 
they came up with their ghetto blasters and wanted to use that spot where we were. And so they looked at our music and we didn't stop because we didn't have enough money yet, so we needed some more cash. So we kept on going. And so they got, you know, they wanted to take the place, but they were so shy, not uh, pushing us away or something. So they started then to move to our improvised music. When I started uh, to know about jazz, I was about uh, eight years old, so World War II was just uh, over, it was not even over, it was still going on. And my hometown, I'm from Göttingen, was conquered by American soldiers. And on our backyard, my father was a roof maker, so we had a little backyard for all our gears, was occupied by GIs coming there with their trucks. And I was running around, not like today, people with a guitar. I had an accordion with me, eight years old. And so I was playing my folk tunes or whatever I, I, I could. And there happened something in my life which had never happened before. When I passed by this black GI making a fire and cooking him some food, he grabbed his guitar and started to jam with me on my folk tunes, because those folk tunes I played were so simple and were almost like those folk tunes you have in the United States because all our European tradition has, has been moved to the United States. So I had my first jam when I was eight years old. I listened to the AFN, that was the American Forces Network radio, and the first thing I really was aware about was Louis Armstrong, because that man was singing to me like, like no one ever had been singing. We were talking about church songs before before we turned on the camera, but the uh, essence of what Louis Armstrong was giving me, was handing me there, in giving me his songs, his music was hope for me. There was hope and glory and that terrible war. If I tell you my experiences of this war, you wouldn't believe it, but we, we don't want to go into that now. But this is the way like I would turn on to jazz because I had been experiencing nothing but war in my life. Being eight years old, I thought the whole world was on war, on fire. So when I heard Louis Armstrong, there was, because I'm a musician, my father is a piano, was a piano player and roof maker to make his money. <coughs> but I heard something in there which I had never heard before. And I've been, so he turned me on, Louis Armstrong turned me on. I couldn't have gotten a better person to turn me on than Louis, you know. And from that moment on, I, f I felt that there was something which I want to go along to. You know, this is, this is how, how, how my life really started when I was turned on to jazz music. Yeah. So that's my early start. to be more personal, more uh, to develop our own, but also the teamwork to get, to, because that, that was Duke Ellington, that was Charlie Parker, that, all these guys, Monk, I, 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 I've met Monk, I've met a lot of people in my life, and I learned from them how you just be yourself. <laughs> Break dancer, 
dancer from Tajikistan with that hip hop unit. And he and me, it was funny, their whole program was always putting him and me together. And we were improvising. I was playing and he was doing his dances to it. He listened to me. And like, like I played with Steve McCall, I just described to you before. He's very talented. I mean, like he's one, he's magic. We, we have been doing, in the meantime, duo concerts. Him dancing and me playing, <coughs> improvising, playing my tunes, whatever there was. And the people have been writing up, like, uh, this is the first time that music and dance is following each other. Usually you have dance to a piece of music, classical music or in a musical or whatever. The music is written and then the choreographer puts it in. And all the improvisations which have been done was always a failure. It never worked because the dancers have to count, they have to know what's coming before they know what to do. But this guy, I've been working with, with, with Noriev and some great dancers from the classical field. Uh, they wanted my music uh, for dance piece. I had to give them a music piece and then they were, uh, were choreographing their pieces on it. But whenever I tried with those classical trained ballet dancers, to improvise, they couldn't do this because you need to have control about your body. You have to have a link to your mind. You have to have, have a link um, to your spontaneity and the control. So this guy and me, we we doing this since 11 years that we go and and do these concerts. I've even put him and some of, of his other friends who learned from him how to do it, to be spontaneous. Because when they go out with us, they don't know what kind of music we're going to play. Because when the saxophonist is playing a solo, they don't know what he's going to play. So they have to spontaneously go with our music. <laughs> which was called The History of Jazz. So the concert was starting New York, all famous musicians with Dixieland and swing and went all through the styles. And I and Perry Robinson, who was in my band at that time, we were invited to join this. It was in one of those churches in New York. And so when they played Dixieland, we didn't wait when the free jazz was on. We played with those Dixieland players. And they were all saying, hey, I thought these guys were religious musicians, they cannot play. Yeah? Uh, you know, um, stupid stuff. <laughs> Clarinets, hey, we played Dixieland and swing and all. And then when we came more and more to the modern times, then a lot of these people stopped playing. But there was this trombone player, who was a very old man, old black man. He kept on playing. His name was J.C. Higginbosom. He played with Louis Armstrong and all stuff. And then when we played the free part, he couldn't stand anymore. So he was sitting on the He was getting off the. Then he said, when you call this free jazz, I've played this all my life, he said. Yeah. Okay? So that is the real message of jazz, you know, that freedom. When I was going out on the streets in the night at 2 o'clock in New York to go to the river, because when I have my head full and I've been working all day, like in an office in my house, I go take a bike ride, get fresh air because there's coming the fresh air from the sea is coming into the city. And there all the people are dancing and walking and all this stuff. And they were doing just, I mean, I mean they were doing more jazz live than you could hear from the jazz musicians playing in the clubs. I mean, it was, it was so that hip hop, what was going on there was action. It was really very.
situation of a musician, of a foreign musician coming to Berlin is uh, more or less uh, say the same like uh, the situation of, of a Berliner who was living here for, for a long time because of this, uh, of this uh, history of, of, of the city. <laughs> I have been on tour in Europe for the last two weeks. Uh, prior to going on tour right now, this is the, uh, the uh, 18th of February, 2012. Everybody is a stranger in this place and everybody, uh, everything has to be a uh, sink over. There are always uh, possibilities to do it in another way. And on January 30th, before that, I had the opportunity to play with the great percussionist Anne Benick from, from Holland. In other cities uh, you have uh, families living there for the last 500 years and they knew very exactly what to do and how to do what. And uh, here in Berlin nothing is, uh, everything can be done in another way. On this tour, I was fortunate enough to do duets with Silke Eberhard, who is from Berlin. We have now we have in Berlin a very uh, uh, creative, uh, not a scene, this is a couple of, of, uh, of different uh, scenes which were not uh, closed, um, they, they were in connections and this started in the mid of the 90s, 90s that the musicians from all over the world uh, are coming and even this process is not come, came not to an end, this is uh, still uh, developing every week, some somebody is coming here to Berlin, and everybody has uh, his own connections to to the places uh, they are coming from. We have a lot of Australian musicians, musicians from Canada, from Asian countries. This process started in the mid of the 90s and the first uh, reason was that uh, Berlin was a, a really big city uh, <coughs> with these two uh, different uh, kinds of history and it was a cheap place. Here it was possible to, to, uh, to, to find a room to stay and uh, also uh, we, we have uh, we had a lot of space here in the city, not used any longer. So a lot of uh, small venues. It was very easy to establish a, a venue where you can can play. And uh, musicians done could do it by by their own. They were not depending on some producers or some uh, pub owners uh, who invited them. They could make their li life uh, uh, by their own and they could uh, find places and establish places where uh, they could play and uh, try out new things. These uh, music musicians coming here are coming from very different backgrounds. They are not only jazz uh, musicians uh, interested in uh, uh, developing of a new jazz, and there are other musicians who never play jazz. They uh, came from, from an improvising tradition in European music and contemporary music. There are also musicians coming from uh, from traditional music, and uh, they are interested in uh, in connecting their their background. And this is a, a very good model for, uh, for, for the necessities our uh, society needs now. The world came so close together.
more and more uh, mankind is uh, used to, to work together, but uh, the, the, the thing is to find a way to work together without uh, letting one's own cultural background be behind you. Uh, we, we need a, a way to, to work together with uh, all the richness, the, the cultural richness we, we, we have uh, as experience and to uh, bring this experience into a creative uh, process. We started from Sydney and, and went south and right around the continent and then up north, just really circled. And we looked essentially um, at two of the iconic fences, the rabbit proof fence, which goes from north to south in the west And also Australia. the dingo fence, or the, the dog fence, which is sort of a north to south, but also um, east to west uh, in direction. And it's the longest man-made artifact in the world is twice as long as Great Wall of China. Well, Hollis and I, my partner and I, we've made a number of trips around the country playing the fences. I think it was a total of 40,000 kilometers in four or five it years. It sounds way out, or somebody that just likes swing, or just likes bluegrass, uh, to, to say, oh, we play the fence. That sounds like a really, such a far, far out thing to do. Basically getting an audiovisual map of the country through the fences. It brings you in direct contact with really the real people of Australia. Uh, I was just wandering around in the field one day and I heard three birds in three different trees singing a trio. of this bird was so beautiful, it was sort of somewhere between a flute and an organ. And the, the phrasing seemed to be so related to jazz, the rhythms, the sort of ending things on the, on the offbeat, but, but, uh, you know, sort of very hip, a lot of the rhythms. Uh, I'm trying to get to the bottom of how they change their material from year to year. And I'm trying to follow little phrases and little motifs and fragments that the neighbor has that, that they maybe they rework in a different way or uh, that they, next year it will be different. Every, every mature bird sings its own set of phrases. There might be some overlap with the neighbor, or there might be none. They sing long songs in the spring from one to six hours in length. And these are nocturnal songs almost always. So they could start at 12.30 or 1 a.m. and sing until the dawn chorus at 6, 6.30. They also sing group songs, and these they do mainly in the autumn. So I go and record them in the autumn as well. And this could be duos, trios, quartets, 
quintets. And they also mimic. So they will put together what appears to be really improvised um, long sections, 12, 15 minutes, nonstop of all the kinds of sounds that they hear that, that interest them. The sound of a horse doing a whinny, a mobile or cell phone ring, ringtone, a uh, car alarm, a dog barking, you name it, they've, they've got it in their, in their mimicry cycles. I was talking about the snap together, snap together beads earlier, so yeah, when you've got that written, you can see, oh, he, he does this part, ba -ba -dum, but before he goes, ba -ba, ba -ba -dum, or ba -ba -dum, you know, so there's little parts that he could, you know, snap together, and you'll see, okay, this is the one thing he does in all hundred of these phrases, but he has other little bits that he can add on. So additive and divisive kinds of um, uh, tricks, and it's staggering when you think that birds are doing all of these kinds of techniques that we thought only humans were doing. And it finally dawned on me one day, ah, because music for me is much more about dance than song. And, and that's why I, I like to put rhythm in the bow. Um, that's why I liked the earlier music, or the Baroque music, which was based on the dance rhythms and bar talk, of course. So just wherever you're. Is that for the guests or is that for us? That's yeah, probably for that's the guests. For all for the guests. Uh, <laughs> we drank their wine. We drank their wine. <laughs> <laughs>
I spoke to various people in the band, and then at a, a certain point, Misha asked me to become like a regular member. Yeah, so like now we're in the, we started today rehearsing with the Instant Compose Pool, and uh, so that kind of uh, evokes uh, the the Instant Compose Pool feeling. Yes, yeah. I joined ICP. Um, in 1982, and one of the first things we did was go to Japan. Um, the other saxophone players in the group at the time were Peter Broltzman and Kevin Keshavan Mosley. The first uh, tour I went on with ICP was quite exciting for me, of course, because I that was the group that I wanted to play with. The one most. of the very first concerts with the ICP for me, I think it was 85 or 84. Uh, we had a concert somewhere in Holland, a small village. So, and I never um, forget like one of the first concerts uh, we had. That story is about the, the two fat ladies walking in a lane in England. What I think find very refreshing at the moment is that there's a that there's a very lively scene of young musicians who are, who are uh, putting on their own stuff and trying things out, and also. And mixing up with the with the old. I had to go by train also. from Groningen, which is like in the north of the Netherlands, to Amsterdam, and then I should meet Misha at his house, and uh, he should. He, Misha was the dr one of the drivers of one of the cars because there were ten members in the group, and there were some cars going to Tilburg. So it was a tour set up by Toshino Kondo, and he spent about a year organizing this tour. It was very well. Very well done, and we had a great time. And they hear a voice like, help me, help Anyway, me. we're on stage in, uh, and this was in Le Mans, France, yeah. festival there. I, I did not like very much to, to, to get lessons. Uh, we had a concert somewhere in Holland, I, a small village. I was scheduled being in Misha's car with, I remember, uh, Larry Fishkind and um, uh, Keshe van Maslak. So the three of us, we, we gathered there at his house, at the steps of his house, and I was first and I rang the bell, no answer. I thought, oh yeah, maybe Misha's uh, out, or yeah, he comes, he will, back, will, he will be back in a couple of minutes. We do a workshop with Han on our conservatory in the east of Holland. Looking forward to that, and it's always a challenge because it's about, well, explaining what is going on in, for example, uh, Instant Compose School. I realized a lot of things about Misha real quick. I, I realized that he likes to create tension however and possible. I'm, I'm standing next to Misha, so I generally make sure that he's got his set list going and he's got, um, that he knows what's going on. And so they were looking around and it was a bit snowy and still they heard that little voice, help me, help me. And finally they found under a fir tree, they found a tiny little green fox, um, um, frog. We played Reflections. Uh, Misha had made an arrangement of uh, Thelonious Monk's and, uh, Reflections. And I did not like the idea of the... Uh, the I, I like to play the piano. I think what's also characteristic of the scene right now is that looking you know, inventing your own spaces where to 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 do it and where to you know offer it to the audience. Now, uh, in the meantime, Larry was coming uh, with his big tuba and Keshevon, and they said, "Oh yeah, Misha is always he's always very uh, lazy, blah blah blah." Um, let's ring the bell again. Brrr, we ring the bell. Thinking Nothing. about that, <laughs> how can you make things clear about? music that we actually we don't like to talk about in the first place because we prefer to just do it. Uh, he likes to put people together that don't necessarily like each other, for instance. We were going to play a piece of his called Varblefje. And um, he asked me to play a solo. I played a solo uh, following the chord structure. And afterwards he comes to me and says, uh, up. Uh, listen, you don't have to play it, it that way. <coughs> but it was a kind of weird, you know, we had this appointment at his house and there was no Misha. I, th 
one of my first gigs, so I thought, what, what is this? I don't have the lessons anymore after the year 40. And the frog said, help me, I'm bewitched. Uh, there's, there's obviously not enough established places for, these, for this music to be heard, so one just has to invent something. Yeah. I learned uh, a certain aesthetic, and it's kind of a rigorous aesthetic, although at the same time anything can happen. So I get my music ready and set it up, and then I go, hey Misha, where blaf you? And he says, Art Blakey? I didn't understand what he what he was saying. He said, no, you don't have to play it that way. You can open it up, and uh, uh, and that was a very important uh, important moment because I started realizing that um, it's very important to to tell your own story, whatever the situation. No, and we is. thought, like, yeah, what can we do? Wait. Just wait. No, like, and, and then like 15 minutes later we thought like, no, it's, it's, it should be back now. Like, I'm, I was already waiting an hour, something like that, outside. <laughs> uh, no, Misha. So we tried to ring the bell again and then the door opened. So it's actually interesting to, to, to because we still play as a group, then to test this material, what is still what is really like, well, but this is a bit outdated, or it's not outdated, or the, the ideas, or the, the, the approach of the music. And after <laughs> the war, uh, I still didn't want to play uh, pieces from other... Composers. If you kiss me on my mouth, it will be all over and I will be a drummer and I can play concerts all over the world for, for you and I can make you rich any style you want is a word of course interesting can also mean that it's not really happening it's still interesting so it's very very open and very free it's not uh, what we do here is, is not uh, dogmatic Misha, he way. was in his house he said, yeah, oh yeah, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, I just woke up <laughs> and it was like five o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> At that time I didn't realize that his day and night rhythm was completely swapped. Like, you know, he, he lived, uh, yeah, uh, from f four or five in the afternoon till the next day uh, uh, in, in the early morning. I, I was only interested in him. Uh, In improvisation. So the, the less fat lady looked to the other one and said, please kiss him on his mouth. Then we're going to be rich. We have no financial... Uh, and I think I'll, I'll bring in some, some of the ICP and thoughts. At that time I thought, well, I play a traditional piece that has a chord structure. Um, let's play sticking to the chord structure. And when I played an open piece, I would play differently. Well, there, well, there are things that are good and there are things that are bad. So, in a sense, it completely ruined me for a lot of other musical situations. So, it's the standing joke. So, when we play Varblafia, we say Art Blakey, and then he'll say Varblafia. Piano was my f first uh, thing to, uh, to, to be interested so, in. It keeps going on and on with him. He likes to play that game. And we're going to be rich. We have no financial um, problems anymore in this time. We're going to be fine. And we have a guy with us, a drummer. This piece of it has been, it's rooted in the 60s, which is great. But now we're in the, already in the next century. And then, they, well, then play the piano. That's all right. And then I, I played the piano and had not s the same need that I had f for my f uh, improvisations 
in in in. Forty-two or three. So fine, and then yeah, Misha said he said he invited us in his house. Like yeah, come in. I'll uh, yeah, I'll make some breakfast for me. So and I, I he had to shower and everything. But it was like late already. I thought like shit, we have to go to the gig in Tilburg, which is was at that time like a two-hour drive. Like oh, we will be certainly too late. And Misha they didn't worry. He said oh, relax. Uh, who wants a cup oh, of coffee? <laughs> well, that was uh, more or less a little bit forgotten. And that made me aware that it's possible to play freely within a certain structure. The bigger lady looked at her very, very angry. And she said, you are dumb, aren't you? The founders, Misha and Hom, because they, they are, in the 60s, they had their uh, thing, I suppose. I'm listening to old stuff, what they did in the Mission Mengelberg Quartet with uh, the late Pete Nordak as an uh, alto player. Man, that's incredible. Uh, yeah, I, and yeah, he had done his shower uh, program. No, that was another uh, uh, half an then hour later. I had <laughs> only interest in playing jazz music. But it is like also a very traditional 50s style court very inspiring very good playing of Misha very sharp very fresh and, and we were ideas. thinking like shit what's happening and then he said yeah I'm gonna make some breakfast for myself you want also something <laughs> yeah we said Misha we have to go to the gig uh, <clears throat> yeah okay <laughs> you can't have much and much and much more money with a talking frog than with a jazz drummer Thank you. <laughs> you have to, to, you have had a cho choice to play the piano, so so play the piano. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's a very old English joke I heard once from Chris Lawrence, a bass player, and I used to tell it also uh, after so or during a solo concert. Like yeah. so, so leave you. And then it, you, well, you Michel writes his own pieces, totally different pieces. European flavor pieces, maybe, kind of marches or waltzes or. So finally, we got on the road, and it was like just be, uh, half an hour before the concert was supposed to start. You know, like so we were sitting there in the car, and I thought, like, oh, what is this? What is this? <laughs> What's happening now? <laughs> and, uh, and that helped yeah. me a lot, and I was able to develop my own voice by this um, little meeting with me. And suddenly on the highway I thought like, yeah, now now is about time that we start. So Misha was counting off, one, two, three, four, burp, okay, start. <laughs> of course we were not there. So, so I, d I didn't play Bach or, or Mozart or whatever. What so you, 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 you work to people, you wipe them up and you think, by the way, do you know this joke? And yeah. so, so you, it, it, it sort of a, it works like a counterpoint for, for, for me, and that's what I what I but really want. We arrived want. in Tilburg much too late. I think one or even two hours later than scheduled, and ev the 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 room was packed. I played. And uh, I Mengelberg's plays the piano. <laughs> and I remember Han was like with a purple head and completely <laughs> very stressed up, like because Misha was again. So very I, too late. To summarize, I'm having a great time. There were also like Keshevan and Sean Bergen was in the band. They were literally fighting on stage, like kicking each other. Yeah. And the audience thought it, it was like a part of part of the part well, of the band. Well, that's more or less what I still do. <laughs> Playing the piano. Yeah. So, for example, when when I lay on the floor or sit on the floor and try it, it's you 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 change the acoustics. People are not looking. And the rest was of uh, course there, like drinking, and the audience was there, and they they loved it, and it was like such a happy concert. You, that you, was you change the acoustics. People are not looking. 
uh, to a guy with a red hat behind the drum kit. Oh. Um, so that, uh, that was my first experience with, with ICP uh, in the 80s when I, when I joined the band. And I thought like, wow, what is this? <laughs> That's pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> but and since since then, of course, uh, I, I know the, the the perspective. Everything uh, is is in there. But you know, I was just a, a young kid from the province. I didn't know shit, or so I was <laughs> immediately in the in the 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 heart of everything. <laughs> Giovanni Barcella. Um, I'm originally from Rouge. I studied almost medicine. I stopped in my fifth year. I play the drums and I come from Italy, from uh, Bergamo. And I started after a few travels and meeting uh, an Australian uh, girl in, in Colombia. I started um, a production company and made a short film. I produced a short film. And I met this guy who had a dream to start a little cafe, Chilean cafe. It didn't, we started it, it didn't work out, but I wanted to keep it. And so music came in, into that. Welcome, David. Thank you. That is a, it's a long history with Roger, you know. He's just yeah. opened uh, this, this, uh, this club uh, after we played three years in the Negocito and the other club. Yeah. And we're six, seven years further, and there's a yeah, there's a place now, a better place, and a residenza with a piano. We invite interesting people from here, local Ghent, but also uh, of the whole of Belgium and, and abroad. Yeah. thing is it's it's a bit like a research place. The probably the 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 way to something is more important than the end result. The music has has to be listened to. So we started a label after five years of having maybe five hundred concerts in El Negocito. The label itself started more around and and the con we do every Monday a concert around um, a drummer called Giovanni Barcella. He's a inspirational and really nice musician, but also person. I like the piece in the three. See, this is not the Berlin way, but this is not the Berlin way. <laughs> yeah, you you are, you are uh, fleshy by Berlin, eh? <laughs> yes, I know Berlin, man. There's something that I really always enjoyed in, in music and in especially in, in jazz and improvised uh, is, is the story. It's not a it's not trying to to copy somebody else's music or something. It's funny. After I, 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 I love uh, Berlin but yeah, like uh, Louis uh, this guy. Yeah. But uh, after one week in Berlin uh, I also want to escape. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> I used to play the drums in the in the church. Yes, also in Italy, uh, you had to <laughs> play the drums in church. Beat church celebration uh, in Italy <laughs> in the late 80s. And uh, 
I play so loud uh, in the church, uh, uh, all the priests uh, hate me, you know. I try to play free in the church celebration. <laughs> I start to okay. study a Bergamo with, um, with a great, a great uh, maestro, his name now is, uh, is, uh, is dead, Gian Piero Prina. Hmm? He tell me about the melody in the drums. Hmm? artistic director of the Beam House, where we are right now. That is uh, in the bar of the Beam House, which is also an important portion of the organization. Uh, the Beam House started in 1974 and uh, I got involved in 1976. And uh, the Beam House at the time was part of a bigger organization called uh, Stichting Jazz in Nederland, uh, Dutch Jazz Foundation. Um, and um, this would be a big story to explain, and possibly not so interesting. Uh, the BIMAS always was uh, fairly independent within that organization and, uh, and was separated from the other functions of that organization in uh, the late 80s, early 90s. I'm not even sure about the year right now and continued uh, just as a BIM house and uh, I've been its artistic director ever since and, uh, and have been booking the BIM house since uh, as part of some committee in the first few years and fairly independently from uh, uh, I guess 78, 79 on, on onwards which is quite a long period I uh, sometimes which sometimes takes me by surprise, what that long? Uh, I guess that means it's a, it's a nice thing to do. It is, of course. From the origin of the Bim House, that was started by musicians in the mid-70s uh, to have their own venue, but uh, it, this was not limited to the music of the initiators uh, being very much from the, at that time, new music scene, uh, including uh, Misha Mengelberg, Willem Broeker, uh, Willem van Maanen, Arjen Gorter. The, the organization was uh, started in cooperation with uh, Musicians Association, BIM, uh, uh, Association for Improvising Musicians. Uh, that also included uh, more mainstreamish uh, musicians, uh, bebop based. And from day one, the program was, was this brew of all, all sorts of uh, jazz and contemporary improvised. Um, um, so it's simply part of the history. We, we continue that to this day, uh, including uh, all sorts of uh, the horror world, uh, world music and, uh, uh, and other musics that, that are very hard to define. They, uh, all, all these musics have their, their own share in the music and one of the things that I particularly like about uh, the Bim House and that, that follows from its history and how we dealt with it is that for many, uh, including more traditional players, the uh, reputation is based not just on uh, Dexter Gordon having played here and everybody else, uh, but also uh, being the home of the, the newest music in the field. And, uh, and they very often, um, people who are in, in somewhat more traditional field, uh, want to be associated with this home of new music, which I think is a much better position for the new mu uh, music than uh, have to fight your way in, in this other place, uh, dealing with all these definition problems of jazz and jazz audiences and, and the jazz world that is can be pretty much in the way of the development of jazz, as we know. So it's a, uh, I, I find that particularly interesting. People in marketing, uh, the people working with us, there's also always this little bit of tension, like should we not label these concerts uh, to make it easier for them to take the audience by the hand, uh, you might be if you're interested in this. And uh, I like the, 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 uh, the approach that is used 
everywhere these days. Like if you like this, you might like this, if it's dealt with in a smart way. But I don't like it uh, applied, especially in this place, uh, considering what we just spoke about, uh, to uh, uh, like jazz or advanced jazz or uh, contemporary or, uh, or world music, this, that, and the other. Um, so you have to find a balance to sort of say something about the music and, and, and find an audience without defining it uh, too exactly and exclude uh, everything else from, uh, from who you approach with the information. Like this is for you, that's for you. That's horrible. And, and such a contradiction to the nature of what this place is about. And of course audiences in uh, in the Bimas can be wildly uh, different from night to night, but there's always a bit of overlap. Yeah. And on the extremes, uh, there would hardly be any overlap, but, but well, that's why they are the extremes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because without, without the city support, uh, we would not, uh, I mean, our own income is huge, but it's, uh, to do what we do without this support would be uh, quite impossible right, on this scale. Uh, and another topic, uh, when you look around you in this room, the location we have now, the city built this uh, uh, this spot, a venue for Musikgebouw, Bim House, to the purpose on, on uh, this is the old docklands of Amsterdam, like, like in most old harbor towns. That is, that is on acceptable quality and we'll be looking uh, in the near future into possibilities of having that uh, available online which of course is uh, entirely depending on the musician's consent. You see the critics had written in Downbeat and in other magazines that he, that he doesn't play all the time. He gets off his piano and let the other people play. But what Monk was doing was, Monk was getting off, I watched that in that concert, he was getting off from the piano, and Frankie Dundam was playing the drums. He, he, was a, he was a dancer. Yeah, he, he was a real dancer. He played drums, but he was a dancer. And Monk, he went up from the piano and danced. And he was very voluminous at that time, it was like a bear dancing. But the musicians played with his moves, though he wasn't playing the piano. Con una parola scarna. Solo la bellezza appartiene a quel gesto che sbirciamo di nascosto. Se io penso ogni rifiuto per paura sottile di vendetta a vendere nella penombra io sono come piccola dimenticata stupefazione diciamoci ancora la cosa che piace al senso una terribile visione di chiarezza Sai, non ti servirà. Ed anche il rifiuto perde conoscenza. Un elemento piccolo ma non triste venga adesso. Ci siamo esatti, persi.